For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Mudli. Award-winning journalist Karen Morn joins me today to unpack her latest book, I Will Not Be Silenced. Your book highlights how you became a target of former President Jacob Zuma. And I think many people were confused and some outraged by the case that was brought against you and prosecutor Billy Dana. In the book, you recount an interaction with an Uber driver that kind of reflects the confusion and misinformation surrounding the case. For those who are unclear, can you just briefly outline the case that Zuma brought against you and the subsequent findings of the Peter Marisburg High Court? The genesis of the private prosecution that the former president gave against me was his application for a postponement of his corruption trial while he was actually imprisoned for contempt of the constitutional court. And he was supposed to appear in court, but wanted the case postponed because of certain medical issues. In his application for a postponement, which the state was not opposed to, he included a letter from his military doctor, which referred to a certain unidentified traumatic injury that the doctor said required treatment over potentially a six-month period. And that was the, the genesis of the postponement application. In the actual court hearing, the state in fact complained that there was a definitive lack of specificity in that note. They said they didn't know what was wrong with Jacob Zuma and they wanted their own doctors to evaluate him. His lawyers said, well, what do you expect? We're not going to disclose confidential medical information in this process. I had written about that application and the military doctors saying that there was this undisclosed traumatic injury. And that was then transformed by Jacob Zuma and his legal team into to me, unlawfully receiving information from the NPA, not from Billy Downer directly, but from another advocate within the NPA, and that somehow he was complicit in this allegedly unlawful collusion, which they said amounted to a violation of the NPA Act, because they said it was a criminal offense punishable by a sentence of up to 15 years in jail for a prosecutor to share information with anyone without the permission of the National Director of Public Prosecution, Shamila Vitoy. And interestingly, you write that while the courts vindicated your rights, the legal system doesn't seem to be able or willing to protect you. Can you just tell us why you say this? I think the legal system has protected me as much as it can. The courts have given very strong rulings in favor of myself and Billy Downer. The difficulty, of course, is that where you have someone who does not respect the outcomes of court rulings who go against him and continuously then attempts to appeal completely unwinnable cases, people like myself and Billy Downer can then get locked into the sort of endless, very expensive litigation, which in his case is funded by the NPA and taxpayers, and in my case is funded by News24. And they really essentially needs to be, in my view, more of a finality, that someone who has been shown to be pursuing abusive litigation for particular ulterior purposes, either to delay his corruption case or to silence a journalist from reporting on him, shouldn't be allowed to endlessly delay the finalization of that litigation with appeals that stand no chance of succeeding. And I think that one of the difficulties, and it's a difficulty that ordinary litigants face all the time, is that sometimes the progress of these appeal can be very, very slow, and that's immensely frustrating. Now, you also mention in your book being criticized for writing about the law without a legal qualification, but you believe this is actually a strength. Yes. I mean, if the argument is to be advanced that journalists need to be, for example, trained medical doctors in order to report on health or trained business people or economists in order to report on the economy or former athlete in order to report on sports. It, it, it starts entering the realm of lunacy. I think the key thing for a journalist is to be exposed to the field that they are reporting on and to seek ultimately to understand that field so they can make it accessible to ordinary people. And so I've never claimed to be a lawyer. I've obviously spent decades of my life in and out of courtrooms. But I think the fact that I am actually not a lawyer enables me to take quite dense legal processes and make them accessible to ordinary people in language that ordinary people like myself can understand. Now, comparing Zuma's rape trial to later court appearances, how significant of a role did 
social media play in these cases? And how did it affect yours and other journalists reporting on these cases? Well, I mean, interestingly enough, social media didn't feature in Jacob Zuma's rape trial at all. I mean, that was like 2005, 2006. And I remember I have clear memories of going outside with a notepad and phoning my my desk at the start and reading out like these little paragraphs that I'd written so that we could get it into the late editions of the paper. The internet was really at its genesis. You know, I think Facebook existed, Twitter didn't. And so, you know, the kind of day-to-day commentary that we see, particularly on televised criminal proceedings, was not a feature at all. That trial was very limited. It also wasn't broadcast. And so media were really the outlets which reported day-to-day. Of course, that all kind of changed with the Oscar Pistorius case. I think that was in 2014 that killing occurred. And then subsequently, the the trial played out. And then years afterwards, that was live televised. And that was really the first case where we saw this kind of live tweeting of court proceedings happening because it was being seen all over the world. And since then, people's commentary on court proceedings, people's commentary on the people reporting on those court proceedings has intensified to a degree which is sometimes quite useful because you can see in real time what people are interested in and fascinated by, but in some other ways, profoundly unuseful because it fixates on criticizing the journalist who is there in a way that is oftentimes quite destructive and and can be very personal and insulting in some instances. So one always hopes for a happy balance where there is that participation and people can feel that they have skin in the game in terms of commentary around these kind of important legal processes, but it doesn't end up being destructive focuses on journalists because they are reporting on these proceedings. Now, in the cases involving prominent AIDS activist Fizeka Kuzwayo and Zuma's second wife, Nompomolelo Ntuli Zuma, and the case against you, what role did Zuma's supporters play and how were the lives of these women impacted? I mean, I think one of the most destructive examples was what happened to Vesikile Kuzwai because she had to flee the country with her mother and stay in Amsterdam for, I think, well over a year in a very cold apartment. And essentially because her life was under threat, there were people who would carry a coffin that they said was intended for her outside the court. They would scream, burn the bitch in Isi Zulu as she walked up the stairs of the court. And she had to have bodyguards. She had to stay in a safe house. So it was a very dangerous time for her. She did subsequently return to South Africa, but she always lived a very secretive, safety-orientated life where she was never able to fully reach her potential and tragically died at the age of 41, shortly after that demonstration by young women at the IEC, you know, holding their signs saying, remember Kwesi. For Ma and Tuli Zuma, you know, there wasn't even a trial, there wasn't even a case. She was falsely accused of attempting to poison the president. The now sports minister, Gayton McKenzie, wrote a very kind of fantastic and sensational book, basically saying that she'd had an affair with a CIA agent and abortion. And, you know, she'd been potentially paid 10 million rand to poison the then president's tea. And she lived under the shadow of these false allegations for half a decade until eventually the NPA said, well, we're not prosecuting anyone on this because there simply isn't any evidence. And Zuma himself never actually gave a statement. So, you know, in some respects, both of them lived lives in exile. Both of them lived under the shadow of the false allegations that were leveled against them. In Kwesi's case, of course, she was called a spy you know, being deployed as a honey trap, etc. And in Ma Tuli's case, obviously being made out to be an accused murderer when there was just simply no evidence to substantiate those allegations. Now, your book also discusses advocate Darlene Pulfer's behavior during your case and in subsequent cases, as well as the unusual decisions made by the Legal Practice Council. In your view, how does the legal system and its institutions hinder gender transformation as well as accountability within the legal field? I think we obviously come from a very horrific past as a country, and there's absolutely no denial of that. But I think what's unfortunate with advocate Dali and Porfu is that he has weaponized racial divisions that continue to exist within the legal fraternity to avoid accountability. And he readily resorts to the allegation of racism against anyone who he views as a threat to himself 
or as a potential opponent of his clients that he's serving. And we've seen that again and again. And it's profoundly unfortunate because it undermines the very real and legitimate racism allegations that can be made by people who are victimized in those kind of contexts. And Dali and Porfu has made very unfortunate comments about the now Chief Justice Mandisa Maya when he said we spent the night together in reference to an all-night study session during her first interview for the Chief Justice position. He falsely accused advocate Tuli Marancella, public protector and now professor at Stellenbosch, Tuli Marancella, of being a criminal because of the way in which her affidavit to the Mkwabani inquiry was commissioned. He also attacked the evidence leaders, both of whom are very capable black female advocates, Nazreen Bauer and Mkumisa Mayosi, of racism because they followed the directives of the Section 194 inquiry and produced evidence about the advocates who were being briefed to represent advocate Mkobani, who was then public protector, in her futile attempts to defend indefensible reports because they were looking at the legal amounts of money that were spent in those particular matters. And it's been a repeat pattern, you know, that those advocates then have to defend themselves and then are targeted on social media and receive horrific levels of abuse. But the Legal Practice Council, despite, you know, I know, for instance, the KwaZulu-Natal body leveled complaints about the way in which Advocate Marancela was treated, that there has been this reluctance to deal with those complaints and to be open about them to the extent that the LPC has actually said that it will not provide records with regards to those disciplinary processes unless they get Advocate Mpofu's permission, which he has not given. And your book also mentions a disturbing resonance that Mpofu has with Zuma. Can you just expand on this connection? You know, I don't know how I I necessarily articulated um, the resonance issue, but I think that, you know, I think in one judgment that was given by Nathan Ponin in the SEA recently in regards to Advocate Mpofu's futile arguments in in an Mkobane matter, he actually speaks about the dangers of counsel becoming too close to their clients to the point where they don't actually make decisions that are based in law, but are rather, you know, they're not in the best interests of the client. And oftentimes, you know, when we were in court, Jacob Zuma would be dozing off. There were moments where I I didn't actually know if he really knew what was going on. Um, And, you know, Advocate and Porfu would make extreme arguments. He would, he would say, for instance, that us sharing court papers, the legislature felt that it warranted the same kind of sentence given to a murderer in a non-premeditated murder case. In the SEA, he compared us to child rapists. Uh, You know, when, when there's absolutely no basis in law or in fact for those kind of comparisons. And when people are constantly making those kind of extreme arguments to prop up cases that are completely implausible, that are completely baseless, that have no evidential or lawful substance to them. It really raises questions about how far they're prepared to go to pursue the causes of their clients to the point where they make claims that are so out of the realm of reality that they're almost laughable if they weren't real human beings on on the other side of them. The media landscape in South Africa has undergone significant changes in the recent years. In future, what do you think the role of South African media will be in holding leaders accountable for their misdeeds? I think we've seen a very concerted attack around the world on institutions that have traditionally been the bastions of democracy. And that's the courts, that's civil society, and that's the media. And, you know, I recently spent some time in Berlin with a number of journalists from around the world who repeated the same experiences that I was having in in South Africa, which is obviously a very strong constitutional democracy. And, you know, this thing about journalists, you know, being agents of the West, being agents of the powerful, being propagandists, it's a language that we often hear against us judges the same thing that they've been controlled by powerful shadowy forces. We've seen that in South Africa, and that's often an allegation that Zuma and the EFF, for example, will make against the judiciary. And civil society has also had that allegation made against them, that they are somehow being funded by Western or unknown governments and, and you know, fulfilling their aims 
by challenging clearly irrational government decisions that have real life impacts for ordinary people. And, and I think in some respects, and we as the media, it's a hard revelation or a hard realization to have is, is that they have been successful. That while certain organizations may be trusted by certain quarters of the population, large quarters of the population do not. And their primary news source is social media. And I think that we have to be aware that those kind of that kind of rhetoric is out there and really look long and hard at how we reach people so that their primary, uh, you know, mechanism for evaluating whether something is true or not isn't Facebook. And it is actually reputable media organizations who are acting on the facts and ultimately in the best interests of trying to make sure that people know what is really going on. And lastly, Karen, how has your career in journalism and writing this book changed your outlook on South Africa's future, particularly in terms of gender equality and justice? And what advice would you give to young journalists, especially female journalists, about being persistent in their work? I am very optimistic about South Africa. I think it's an amazing country. I think that You know, people have often predicted doom for us, whether it was, you know, in the transition to democracy or the transition to a non-ANC majority country. I mean, there were people who were saying, oh, the ANC will never allow that to happen. Well, guess what they did? And the world didn't end. We now have a very different political system, um, which is far more cooperative, where the power is is far more um, evenly spread and the world hasn't fallen apart. There's a lot that we need to address is profound social inequality and there is an endemic issue with corruption and a failure to to have proper systems of accountability but there are also people who at great cost to themselves will speak up and hold people to account and people who will be those mechanisms for holding people to account not least of all was our former chief justice Ray Zondor who despite the fact that he had to live with bodyguards and his family was threatened just kept doing his job and produced very far-reaching and important documents that essentially enable us to interrogate our own culture of corruption in real time in a way that I don't think has been possible in any other democracy. So yes, there are clearly issues that need to be addressed, but we aren't a society that doesn't strive to be democratic. We hold up democracy as the bar that we seek to reach. And I think all of us, the vast majority of us, try and strive to reach that bar every day. And that's why I'll always be optimistic about South Africa. That was award-winning journalist Karen Morn speaking to Polity about her latest book, I Will Not Be Silenced.